You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. Tonight, uh, you can't have your pudding if you don't eat your meat. I've got a couple of schoolyard tales. One a tale of uh, strangeness and the other a tale of tragedy. I'm talking Farrar, Iowa and New London, Texas. All that and more on Small Town Secrets. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four, season four of the show of a Small Town Secrets, and it's another another Saturday morning, Friday night, whatever, hopped up on coffee uh, in the dark. Yes, I record the show in the dark, and I'm ready for a new episode. I hope you are, too. This one turned out to be really fun and really interesting, and uh, I cannot wait to dig into it. We're going to be talking about two uh, schools tonight. The first one is the, I don't know, famous, infamous, maybe maybe a little bit of both, uh, Farrar School in Farrar, Iowa. And the other one is uh, the New London School in New London, Texas. Uh, the first one is a kind of unexplicably... Is that a word? Unexplicably? You know what I mean. Uh, haunted location. And the other one is just a tale of tragedy of, a, of an explosion that destroyed an entire school and killed, as far as we can tell, around 600 people back in the 1930s. But those are the main topics on the docket for tonight. I don't have a whole lot in the way of house house cleaning, housekeeping. But I do want to mention I have been working on a little video, which I'm going to be posting to YouTube, uh, which, yes, the show does have a YouTube channel. Up until now, it's just been uh, the episodes, the podcast episodes posted. It's just something my, my podcast host does automatically so that people can listen to the show on YouTube. I haven't actually done a whole lot with it. It's just kind of been there. But some people have discovered the show from YouTube and have left some comments and reached out to me. But this one will be the first, like, video, like, went out and shot some video and got into uh, After Effects and, you know, edited a video and had to remember how to do all that because I haven't had done anything with video for, like, ten years. But um, it's about my experiments trying to develop a kind of solo Estes method. So I'm putting the finishing touches on it right now. Um... It'll hopefully be uploaded by the weekend, so I will tweet that out. Um, you can find a, a link to the YouTube channel on stscast.com, and uh, I encourage everyone to go watch it. There were some interesting things that happened, and uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's uh, something I would like to develop and see if I can tweak tweak this variation of the Estes Method 
and see if you can do it by yourself and get some and see what kind of activity and answers you can get. But really, that's all I've got as far as the intro goes, as far as housekeeping goes. So let's just kind of get into it and talk about uh, the haunting of Farrar School in Farrar, Iowa. Hi there, I'm Logan. And I'm Lindsay. And we host the new podcast, Folklore on the Rocks, where we talk about folklore and lesser-known creatures, cryptids, and monsters from around the world. So when we say lesser-known, we mainly mean that we won't be covering creatures like Bigfoot or Nessie or Chupacabra, just because they're discussed so often, and the world just has so many other awesome options to draw from. Every two weeks, we will be diving deep into the legends and culture that surround a specific creature. And getting a little bit tipsy while we do so. But don't worry, we do our research sober. <laughs> On the weeks in between, we're going to be narrating and discussing folk tales. Some will be historical folklore from the regions that our creatures are from, and some will be modern folklore, such as no sleeps and creepypastas. Ooh. You can find out more about us on our website, FolkloreOnTheRocks.com, on Facebook and Instagram at FolkloreOnTheRocks, on Twitter at FolkloreRocks! So grab a drink, join us, and come on, let's dig deep together. My name is Paige, and I'm the host of Reverie True Crime. Reverie means to daydream, but even daydreams can become nightmares. Come join me and get lost in horrific reverie about true crimes and eerie events. Reverie True Crime Podcast, available wherever you stream your favorite podcasts. Farrar is a small town, more of a hamlet, really. If you look at its Wikipedia page, you won't even find a population listed. It's around 30. Uh, it's actually an unincorporated township close to to Maxwell, Iowa. In this out-of-the-way place on the plains of Iowa is Farrar Elementary, a now defunct school that for some reason has become a hotbed of paranormal activity. The school was opened in 1922 and closed due to the building becoming unsafe and also just the fact that there weren't enough kids around really to, you know, continue using it. Uh, so it closed in 2002. So for 80 years, it was open. For those 80 years, the school at Farrar functioned not just as an elementary, but as a wedding hall, a dance hall, a meeting place, and more. It was the only building around that was large enough to hold any type of large gathering. Now the building serves another purpose. It was bought in 2006 by Jim and Nancy Oliver. They wanted to restore the building to once again make it a venue for weddings and other gatherings. However, things didn't pan out that way. In 2007, famed psychic Jackie Carpenter conducted an investigation there. After her investigation, she told the owners that they should instead open the place up to other paranormal investigators, which they did. The owners actually live in the building. They live in a block off apartment on the bottom floor. Uh, due to their failing health, they leave most of the upkeep and meetings with visitors to Will, the caretaker. Will and his wife, Jacqueline, were actually married in the school and have their own share of weird experiences to share. One evening, while opening the place up for a group of visitors, they were both up on the first floor in the auditorium. Will noticed what seemed that it seemed to be much darker than it usually was. Uh, dark almost to the point of disorientation. He asked his wife to come and join him on stage. They both watched, uh, I believe by the light of Will's lighter, so they could see, uh, as a gray, human-sized figure appeared and was sitting in an armchair that resides on stage. If you watch like any video or see any pictures of Farrar School uh, and they show the auditorium, you'll see that there is like a chair on stage and an old 
booth uh, from a restaurant. They just kind of reside on stage for people for people to sit in when they go and investigate. Over the years, Will has run into pretty much every entity at the school, so much so that he's uh, developed a sort of reputation with all of them, for better or for worse. One time, Jacqueline and a local investigator named Jonah saw a dark shadow person in a doorway. Jonah and Jacqueline saw it first, but then Will joined them. As Will got closer to the human-shaped shadow, it sprung from the doorway, and it lunged at the caretaker. Will backed off, and the shadow turned and retreated down some nearby stairs. Another time, Will was with a group of six down in the boiler room. Another shadowy figure manifested. It hovered off the ground in front of everyone before transforming into the face of a haggard old man, and then it disappeared. Here's the intriguing thing about Ferrar Elementary. No one can really pinpoint the reason why the place is so active, or really why it's haunted, quote unquote, at all. There are no past traumatic experiences or deaths, at the school at least, that anyone can really find. It just seems to be a gathering place of energy. Most reports from the school revolve around seeing and hearing what may be past students. In recent years, however, some other entities have made the school their home. They are known as the principal, the janitor, and the librarian. So these are both, all three of these, not both, all three of these are kind of shadowy figures, very tall, they say. At least the principal, they say he's a seven, eight foot tall shadow being. Um, all reside in the property. The principal seems to spend most of his time around the principal's office. That's why he was given that name. Once again, there's no documentation or any real evidence that this is a principal. Uh, the janitor is so called because it seems to spend its time in the boiler room and maybe, uh, maybe in the gym as well. The boiler room and the gym are on the bottom floor. And the librarian seems to be a dark and a dark entity, dark in the sense that it's black, not like an evil thing, just that it's a dark mass, a black mass. And of course, uh, the library. So I just wanted to let everyone know what those things were uh, and where they kind of reside. I'm going to be focusing now on five investigations that have been done at the school. Uh, the first investigation is uh, Richard Estep and E. e. Benton's investigation. Richard and Eric spent three days investigating Farrar in their book, A Haunting at Farrar. They were joined by another investigator named Stephen. Their first night there started off in the auditorium. The three men uh, started off by getting just a few odd shadows and some really weird lights that just seemed to sparkle and kind of come out of nowhere. Uh, that was that was about it for the beginning of their night. But later, they decided to raise up the energy by playing some basketball in the gym. This didn't seem to be drawing too much activity either. But after returning to the break room from the gym, the three started to hear footsteps above them on the next floor. Of course, they are the only ones in the building. They have the keys. That's it. That's just them. Um, upon going to the stairs to check out the noises, Richard yelled, Hello! Up the stairs to the second floor. And seconds later, they got a reply. All three men heard a hello come back in a woman's voice. They all shot upstairs to have a look around, and of course, they found no one else in the building. The next night, they tried the gym again. This time, the gym was a little more eventful. Instead of throwing around basketballs, the team decided to kick them into the darkness on the other end of the gym. So they got the lights on on one end, but not the lights on on the other. So like you're just kind of kicking balls into into the into the dark there. Uh, very soon, strange things started to happen. Something in the darkness was kicking the balls back. They could hear the balls being kicked back at them from the other end. But the even odder thing was 
that though they could hear the balls being kicked, the balls would always come straight at whomever had kicked it, regardless of where the kicking sound came from. So it was kind of like if someone kicked the ball into the darkness, you know, you may you might hear it, you know, be kicked back like on the left side, but it comes whizzing back at you because you were on the right side. It's like the the noises, the kicking noises didn't match up with where the balls actually were coming from. Eric later found himself alone after going outside to get a flashlight and a bottle of water. When he returned, he witnessed a seven foot tall shadow being on the stairs leading to the gym. And uh, another little side note, and I have my notes, but I remember it. Um, the other author, uh, Richard Estep, and I don't know if it was this time they went or if it was one of the other times that they went. He talks about also seeing a shadow figure. And it was a, one of the weirdest experiences he's ever had because this is a shadow. He shines a light on it. It's a shadow. You shine a light on it. It should go away. And it doesn't go away. And that was just... Which is, is very strange. Like, think of that for a little bit. Shining your flashlight on a shadow. But, like, it doesn't dissipate. Like, it's a shadow, but it's solid. The team's final night there was mostly uneventful. Other than Steven hearing a disembodied scream that only he could hear, there wasn't too much to report. So, it's... I, I do... They have a great book. They chronicled everything in the book. Um, I'm going to link to it in show notes. I would suggest grabbing it. Uh, it, it outlines their entire investigation. Uh, then they actually do a night at the Basilica Murder House, which is very close by. So that's in there too. And then the last half of the book, which is where I got a lot of these, uh, some of these other investigations from, is they just go and interview other people that have also investigated for our school and got their accounts and put them as in the books, book as well. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, it's called A Haunting at Farrar. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, the investigation done by John E.L. Tenney and Chad Lindbergh. John Tenney and actor Chad Lindbergh had a short-lived but actually rather excellent show called Ghost Stalkers. In its final episode, they investigated Farrar. Their show somewhat focused on the idea that uh, portals of energy were the reason for some paranormal activity. And this may explain why the school has so much activity. That it it's not haunted, there's just this weird portal that is letting entities and energies through that we can't quite explain. The two take turns investigating alone in the building. So if you've never watched the show, there's only six episodes. I believe it's on I believe it's on Amazon Prime. I actually just bought it, like I own it on Apple TV. Um but it's it's just them, and every once in a while they're they're joined by someone else to help them set up some stuff. But it's literally just them in an RV. One goes and investigates, the other one stays in the RV. They can't even communicate with each other. There's just like a panic button thing unless something really bad happens, so the other one can come coming. Uh, it was a really interesting show. It was a really well done show, and I I wish there was more of it. But there's six episodes, and they're all pretty pretty good pretty good watching. Chad takes uh, night one. Chad is the budding paranormal investigator, so his reactions, even though they might be they might be a bit much, he's a screamer. That Chad, uh, they are genuine, and that's that's the other great thing about the show. You just see someone investigating that they something they don't normally do, but want to do, and just are dealing with it and figuring it out. You know, they don't shy away from him being a frightened person for a lot of it. He starts in the gym by once again shooting some hoops. While doing this, he does hear a loud, unexplained bang. Later, Chad ventures into a classroom and conducts an EVP session. He is met with a rather rude EVP, simply saying, God damn it, Chad. Chad then heads upstairs to the auditorium where he puts on a show for the kids. He gets uh, some more strange noises as a result. You don't really hear them in the show, but he comes up to the kind of the their kind of static camera that the other person can see in the RV, and is like, he's like, I just hear sounds everywhere. This place is just teeming with noises that there shouldn't be. On the next night, Tenny starts in the boiler room, where Chad is new to ghost hunting, 
John Tenney is a veteran. He has conducted hundreds of investigations. He's written books. He has done podcasts. I, he's a guy that I widely respect in this field. He starts off downstairs in the boiler room where he is met with a few knocks and sudden blast of very cold air. So cold that you see him like clutching himself, shivering in on the episode. Then, when making his way to the principal's office, John is caught off guard by a large shadow bean. He wasn't able to get it on camera, but he was able to later make a sketch of what he saw. And that sketch will be in the show notes. And in the in the Farrar book, he was also interviewed in the Farrar book about like this episode. He kind of has come to the conclusion that he wasn't maybe he wasn't seeing like one bean, but that maybe it was it might have been a two kids on top of each other, or more like this dark bean behind a smaller entity, either protecting it or you know creeping up behind it. And if you do look at at the uh, drawing, look at the negative space of what would make the legs and like the lower the lower part of the body and you will start to make out because it's shaded and kind of weird you will start to see where there does seem to be like a big black like a big dark entity here and then a very light entity with a head and just stuff beside it the more you look at it the more you see it it's a great drawing it's interesting this bean would follow Tenny around for the rest of his investigation later in the night Tenny's audio recorder will not work inside the building while trying to do uh, EVP sessions, his recorder will not pick up his voice at all while he's in the building. When uh, when he steps outside and tests the recorder, it works fine. But as soon as he goes back into the building, once again, it won't pick up his voice. Then there is the story of Lisa Covander. Lisa Covander is a paranormal investigator as well as an author from Nebraska. In 2010, her and her two friends, Beth and Lacey, went to investigate the school. During a spirit box session, one of her friends was told to stop it or I'll kill you, which is pretty intense in itself. However, what happened later in the library was even more frightening. The three women found a spirit board, a Ouija board, whatever, in the building. So it wasn't theirs. They didn't bring it. They found it already there. So they decided to set up a laser grid and start doing a session with the board. And they did this in the library. During an answer from whatever is communicating with them, something attempts to stop the session by pulling the planchette over to goodbye. Lisa, I think it's Lisa talking, I'm not 100% sure, tells the bean no and that they need to answer the question. After this, she is pushed with what she has said was two hands across the room. So this is on YouTube. I've linked to the video. They show it because she's also in the Ghost Talkers episode. They show just her being pushed. But if you want to watch like the entire session, it's like three and a half minutes long. They stop it, obviously. But they don't... The only thing I, I tried to get on her... I found her on Twitter, but it doesn't look like she checks Twitter a lot. But maybe she'll message me when she does... I, w I was really curious to see, like, what question she asked, because that's not in the video. Uh, the answer is because you can hear them spilling it out, and they were spelling out the word something. So they go S O M, uh, you know, and then they get to something, and then the thing is like, no, goodbye, no, go and she's like, no, no, answer the question, and then she is just shoved across the room. Like, the room is dark because they have that laser grid thing going, so you can't see a whole lot but you can hear her tumble across the floor, hit the floor, and freak out, and just, you know, like, she, I think she even says that something is on top of her and to get off at one point. So it was pretty frightening. It would be soon after that that the activity in the school would become more negative, and uh, some have looked at Lisa and that spirit board session as the reason why. Others, like John Tenney, and even, I, I don't agree with this either, don't believe that to be the case. I think spirit boards are just another tool that can be used. But that being said, we just we don't know what's on, what's on the other side of them. 
you know. So I don't I don't think that Lisa and her friends let anything loose. If that board had anything to do with something weird negative coming through, I think it was whoever left that board there. Because I don't know, I think about it like this, like if you brought a spirit board to a place, logic would dictate that you would uh, take it home with you. Now, yeah, they might have forgotten it, but if, you know, I feel like uh, like an Ouija board is not like, ah, crap, I left, you know, uh, batteries on the windowsill at the school. It's an Ouija board, like, you did a session with it, it probably stuck in your mind. So I would, I would venture that maybe somebody before them, whoever brought that board, they might have, they might have caught the attention of something that they didn't know what it was and had it come through and maybe frighten them enough to just up and leave the board there. I don't know. It's interesting, but I, I mean, I think she gets a little bit of a bad rap, and I don't, I don't think it was her because it's like you kind of see that that whatever that was kind of it just feels like it was there before they got there and they just, you know, set it off again. Uh, Amy Bruni and Adam Barry are the hosts of Kindred Spirits. In their investigation into Farrar, they found much the same activity that everyone else kind of got. You know, they got some kind of kid activity. They got some kind of, you know, different entity and, you know, activity as well. But they did have a rather interesting Ethies Method session with Psychic Chip Coffee, which revealed that there did seem to be two forces in the school. That of the children, and that of something else. And that was also what was kind of interesting about Back to the Ghost Stalkers episode. They both, like Chad and John, both have different missions for themselves. Chad is very much like, I want to connect with those kids. Where Tenny is like, I'm going to find out what that principal thing is. So they both had very different... That was just something I forgot to mention that I wanted to. But not to keep going back to that one, but that is my favorite investigation of them all. Upon doing research, Amy did come across one possible reason for perhaps some of the activity. In 1975, a man named Terry, and in the episode, they just say Terry, but I was able to find who it was, and his name is Terry Lee Vandenhall. He was found murdered. His body had been dumped on a nearby vacant farm just outside of Maxwell. Now... That is close. I think it's only like a couple miles away from the school, maybe three miles away from the school. But, and it's interesting, but here's the thing. Like, so like I said, I, I found the dude, I found the guy's name. It's an unsolved murder case. In fact, I think it's going, I'm going to do the uh, STS Backroads episode on the Patreon on, on Terry, on his story. So that's what's going to be the next bonus episode on Patreon. If anyone would like to go to uh, patreon.com slash stscast and sign up for that, that'll be the next episode I'm doing. We'll get into his case. But, you know, yeah, he was murdered close to the school, but one, he didn't go to that school as a child. He, he didn't grow up around there. Uh, there is a cemetery across the street from the school. He's not buried in that cemetery. He has no real connection to Maxwell or Farrar or the school or anything, and uh, I think it was my mom, we were talking about this, she she made the point that if any place would be haunted, wouldn't it be the vacant, wouldn't it be the abandoned farm? Which makes a good point, but we'll talk more about Terry later in the Patreon. And then there is Corey Taylor. Lead singer of Slipknot and Stone Sour, Corey Taylor is also no stranger to the paranormal. Corey... His then wife, which I think at the time would have been Stephanie Lovey, but I'm not sure, and a ragtag group of fledging paranormal investigators conducted their own hunt at Ferrar School. And why not? It was right in Corey's backyard. Their night started off with a bang. Corey's ex-wife got a sense of a boy saying the Pledge of Allegiance somewhere in the building. She then zeroed in on a room across the hall. It was actually a room that Corey and another investigator, Kennedy, had just been in adjusting some audio recorder. The team made their way back to that room. At first glance, nothing seemed off. 
and then Corey noticed that an encyclopedia volume, which had been sitting on a windowsill, was now on the floor. Pages had been torn out of the book and littered the whole classroom floor. Corey and Kennedy had been in that room just minutes before. No windows were open or had been open, and only Corey's team were in the building. Later in the night, two more of Corey's friends showed up. He showed them around, and when the trio got to the basement floor by the gym, one of the, one of the friends that had showed up felt a sudden rush of wind shoot by him and something unseen step on his foot. Later that night, the group had gathered in the auditorium and were talking. Corey had a recorder on stage with a red light on it, and as the group jawed on, he kept seeing, out of the corner of his eye, the red light being blocked by something. So just like as a, something just kept walking in front of it or appearing in front of it. The auditorium temperatures also kept fluctuating as well. Upon reviewing a mountain of audio evidence, Corey picked up a bean who seemed to be humming a tune. It was picked up in various rooms on various recorders, almost as if the entity was walking around the building just humming away. As if almost a parting gift, Kennedy, who had been alone in the school while everyone else was outside, he kind of, this was kind of near the end of their night, he had been alone for 10 minutes, and he had a recorder on him, and he was just kind of, you know, I'm just going to sit here in the dark, run the recorder for 10 minutes or so. And after about 10 minutes, he got up and talked into the darkness around him. And this is a quote. Well, I think I'm going to go outside with everyone else. We might be gone for a little bit, so if there's anything you want to say or do before I go, here is your chance. Can you make a noise, or a sound, or anything? Kenny then leaves the building while saying, Well, it was worth a shot. Then, when the building is empty, there are three knocks heard over the recorder of a folding chair. So I'm not going to get too much into it, but if uh, the cards, if the right cards are pulled and the stars align, I might have... Uh, something pretty special coming up in the works. Uh, I'll just leave that there for right now. And if it doesn't happen, I'll tell everyone what, what it was. But I, I also really like Corey's um, experiences and their, their investigation because they seem to have caught stuff that no one else did. They didn't appear to see any shadow people. Mostly they saw children. They also, I didn't really go into this, but they also got a weird vibe in one of the bathrooms whenever they would go in there they would feel sick or nauseous and there was just a bad vibe and a bad energy in that bathroom and that's something that no one else is like the only th the only time i've ever heard about this kind of dark bathroom is from from Corey taylor and everyone's experiences from there but so they had they got some stuff like you know the the ripping book and all that they got some stuff that no one else had really experienced and i thought that, that was pretty interesting in itself. But as I said earlier, the real mystery for our school is not that it's haunted, but why is it haunted? And there are many ideas put forth to help maybe give some sort of explanation. Is it as simple as entities venturing over from the nearby cemetery across the street? Is it just a better place to hang out than the cemetery? don't know. If that's the case, why doesn't it happen in other places? Or maybe it doesn't, we don't know. Some have posted that it's not the building, but the grounds that it's built on that are active. Many have pointed to a 260-year-old tree on the property. Will, the caretaker, has been told by researcher David Roundtree, and I had forgotten his name until I got to the show notes, but David Roundtree is the guy in Ghost Stalkers. He's kind of the third guy in Ghost Stalkers that would kind of come and help out sometimes and set up equipment or use new equipment and stuff. But he told Will that uh, that tree was used in Native American ceremonies. And many psychics have also gone on to say that that tree gives off a strange energy. The school, like I said, was more than a school. And since it was the only real building that could hold any large group of people, then maybe, just maybe, it's a place that the dead, if you believe that this energy or the spirits of people past, want to come back to. And why the sudden influx of these other somewhat negative entities? Many attribute that to a portal being opened. By a spirit board, maybe? Found in the school? 
or by some other means? The three entities, the principal, the janitor, and the librarian, uh, do not seem to pop up until after that encounter. It can't be said for sure, but uh, one of the theories, one of the ideas I thought was really interesting was from John Tenney. He talked about in the Haunting at Farrar book that since the Ghost Stalkers episode, he's been back numerous times. He's done investigations. He's led investigations. He's done, he's done some talks there. And he is kind of... He is kind of the mind that there's only one entity. It's not three. Because what he says is, I'll take a group of people in there, and they'll split them up, and we'll have people on all three floors. And never will we get more than one of those entities to do anything at a time. The principal is doing something on the top floor, and the librarian and the janitor nowhere to be found and vice versa. So he's kind of, over the years, cultivated this idea that it's not three entities, it's just one that maybe is using different personas or it's just, you know, from going from place to place. And that, that is a, I mean, you, I didn't put, I didn't even put half the stuff that they talk about, not near anything that they talk about in that book, but some of Tenny's ideas about what is going on are really outside the box and really interesting and I'm just going to let you guys to uh, hopefully grab that book and read it. Farrar's school is there. It's alive and it's ready for visitors. There may not be much to do in Iowa, but if you're there, maybe considering a detour to Farrar Elementary School. Next up is the story of the New London school explosion. Uh, something that has kind of been... It, it was... It's an important story. It's a tragic one, but one that was kind of forgotten for a long time, but has come back in recent years. And it's one I've kind of always wanted to talk about it, so let's talk about it. Uh, the small town of New London was first just called London. However, upon finding out that a post office had already been established in another county, the, the town changed its name to New London in 1931. Six years later, in 1937, an explosion at the New London school destroyed the lives of many. Two elements came together in the 1930s Rust County to create the school. First off, it was the Great Depression and the New Deal had rolled in the town, funding and employing many to build the new school as a public works project. It was a million dollars it cost to build that in 1930, uh, 30, like six, I think. Secondly, oil had been discovered in the area, and this not only boosted the local economy during the grips of the Great Depression, but it would also help to further fund the school. So all of a sudden they found oil and all these gas companies and oil companies started kind of heading into New London to uh, get that oil. All the new oil companies not only helped boost the economy, but one of them might have lent to its undoing. During the school's construction, the school board nixed the proposed boiler room for steam heat, which is what originally it was going to have, and instead they decided to go with installing 72 gas heaters around the building. Then, in early 1937, like the school's already been open, it's been going for a little bit, the board decided to cancel their natural gas contract. They then hooked into the Parade Gasoline Company's waste gas line. What this essentially was were the uh, fumes, the natural gas fumes that are given off by the oil that would just be burned off by the company. This was also known as raw or wet gas. It was a form of natural gas that the company just threw away. So by tapping into it, the school board could basically heat the school for free, which wasn't like uh, a safe or like ethical thing to do, but no one back then really batted too much of an eye at it. Gas companies in the care, they were making money hand over fist, and it was just waste product to them anyway, 
and school board, you know, ooh, we'll save so much money. So you can see where this might be going. This quickly installed gas setup soon started to leak, filling the 250 foot long crawl space under the school with odorless gas. No one could smell the gas building up, so no one was none the wiser. And one of those that had no idea what was underneath them was uh, Lenny R. Butler. Butler was a manual training instructor, and on March 18th, sometime between 3 and 3.30, Butler fired up a belt sander. It is thought that the spark from this power tool is what caused the massive explosion. Witnesses to the explosion saw the walls bulge out and the roof actually lift off the top of the building before coming back down. Then the whole main building collapsed in on itself, spewing plaster and concrete all over town. The explosion was so great that not only could it be heard from four miles away, but a two-ton concrete block was hurled, you know, was hurled away from the explosion and smashed into a Chevy that was parked nearby. And I have a picture in the show notes of that Chevy. It was a 1936 Chevy. It was new, and uh, it wasn't new after that. At the time, there was a PTA meeting in the gym, which was its own separate building. The people in that meeting were the first responders, but soon many from around town came to help. It didn't take long for the Texas, Texas governor at the time, James Allred, to send the Texas National Guard, the Texas Ranger, and the Highway Patrol to assist in aid and recovery. Uh, other people that showed up were the Boy Scouts, uh, airmen from a nearby airbase, just a lot of people just scrambling to help. Also dispatched were 100 nurses, 30 doctors, and 25 embalmers. Buildings in nearby towns such as Overton, Kilgore, and Henderson, as well as others, uh, became makeshift hospitals. Even the media who came to report on the event were quickly thrown into recovery efforts as well. In fact, New London School was one of Walter Conkright's early assignments. He was 22 years old at the time. It took 17 hours in the rain to declare the site clear. Most of the dead could only be identified by items of clothing or fingerprints. Most of the bodies had either been burnt beyond all recognition or decimated by the explosion. This happened on a Thursday. The school was going to be closed on Friday so the school could participate in an interscholastic meet. Fortunately, because of this, uh, first through fourth grade had been let home early. Still, it's estimated that around 600 children and adults perished in the explosion. School was opened 10 days later, utilizing tents and the undamaged separate gymnasium. The school would be rebuilt and that was completed in 1939. It's, uh, it would become the West Rusk High School in 1965, and that's what it is today. It's still there, and they still use it as a high school. The community received much support through the difficult time. I mean, they got, you know, from all over the country, uh, just, you know, condolences and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, Adolf Hitler even sent them a letter of condolence, which uh, across the street from the school, there's a museum, a new London museum, and apparently that letter is in that museum, and you can go check it out. A lawsuit was brought against the gas company and the school board, but the court found neither guilty of any wrongdoing. In fact, I don't I don't know his name off the top of my head, and I forgot to put in my notes, but the the kind of the superintendent of the school who lost a son to the explosion had to resign because the townsfolk were threatening to lynch him because of what happened. If you find yourself driving through New London on State Highway 42, you'll drive past the high school, which looks pretty much like the original school. You will also see a granite cenotaph memorial in the middle of the highway. And the cenotaph is kind of like, it's a, it's a concrete kind of casket, an empty casket. Uh, I have pictures of both of those, what the school looks like now, and, and the cenotaph in the show notes. But that is the tragic story of the school. So yeah, the first one was fun and ooky and spooky, but this one is just really 
just a sad thing. But the good thing that did come of it, the reason why natural gas has, why we put a, an odor into natural gas is because of this. After this happened, Texas started doing it, and then it quickly became like a national thing to put, uh, to add a substance called mercaptan to natural gas. And that's why natural gas now smells like rotten eggs, so that we know when there's a gas leak. And it's because of New London School that we have that. So moving on, uh, we are at intermission. I'm going to play a new song, a new track. It is called Goblin March. Uh, kind of because of hell here, I'm not going to lie. I want to call it Goblin March. But it's the first first one that I finished using the eight-string guitar. So I'm going to take a listen to that. And when we come back, we've got those local headlines to talk about.
So in kind of a rarity for, I think this is the first time this has ever happened, may never happen again. All three news stories are updates to topics we have discussed on this show. The first one is a from MyRacingCounty.com by Mike Ramzik. And this uh, headline says, Lake Geneva resident claims he saw a werewolf-like creature twice in one month. With the coronavirus affecting thousands, people afraid to leave the house, and racial tensions running high in the United States, stories about werewolves can provide the uh, quite necessary distraction. But werewolves? Seriously? Around here, the Beast of Bray Road is a famous legend, known for its location on Bray Road, which starts along Highway 11, east of Elkhorn, and winds west to Highway NN and I-43, just outside of Elkhorn Area High School. There's been a movie about this mythical beast, a seven-foot hairy brown giant that has frightened locals who claim to have seen it. One of these locals is a Lake Geneva resident, Ron Rice. Every once in a while, Rice travels to Lyons for work, where he drops off fertilizer on a farm on Highway 36, just west of Church Road. It's a Burlington address, and there is a circle, gravel driveway, where Rice loads up a truck with fertilizer. Uh, these are deep woods, according to Rice, about 150 feet away from the driveway. Back in May, Rice was on a routine drop-off in broad daylight, sitting in his truck. He looked into the distance, about 150 feet, he thinks, and caught a figure in his eye. This thing was huge. It was over seven feet tall, Rice said. It was brown and hairy, with coarse hair. It walked out and picked something up, then turned its back to me and went back into the woods. Two weeks later, Rice said he saw the beast again, and it walked out of the woods and quickly returned. According to Wikipedia, the beast is a werewolf-like creature, and the creature was first reported in 1936. A rash of claimed sightings in the late 1980s and early 1990s prompt a local newspaper, the Walworth County Week, to assign a reporter, which would have been Leonard Godfrey, to cover the story, and the lore grew from there. Southern Lake Newspapers, the company that publishes this website, last reported on a sighting of the beast in February 2018. Danny Morgan reported seeing the beast about 10 p.m. January 27th in the town of Spring Prairie while driving from Lake Geneva to his home in Menominee Falls. Morgan also provided a blurry cell phone photo of the beast that accompanies the story. And yes, there is a very blurry cell phone photo of the beast. Uh, unless it has really short legs, it kind of just looks like a normal dog caught in mid-jump. But uh, there's a picture, and it's linked in the show notes, and you can take a look and judge that picture for yourself. So, Beast of Bray Road update. Update number two. We are going back to Pascagoula, Mississippi. This is from the Clarion Ledger. This is by Brian Broom. The headline reads, hold on, because it keeps disappearing on me. Like, they put this weird little thing that comes over comes over it. They didn't make it up. Interview recording surfaces in the Pascagoula alien abduction case. Uh, so here we go. It's been 47 years since Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson contacted the Jackson County Sheriff's Office claiming they were abducted by aliens. Recently, a recording said to be made that night of what they told the sheriff, Fred Diamond, and Captain Glenn Ryder has surfaced. It was about the time the coronavirus hit, Parker of Mars Point said, when he received two copies of the recording. I have been talking with him on the internet. He just showed up to my house. Parker explained that the man who gave him copies of the recording was an officer with the Pascagoula Police Department on the night the abduction occurred but does not want to be identified. Parker said the officer was involved because he fielded roughly 50 phone calls that night from people claiming to have seen something unusual in the sky. When I sat down and listened to it, it hit me how real all of it was. Parker said it kind of choked me up a little bit. I never heard it, not the full recording, just the piece where Charlie and I were locked in the room and they walked out. I was surprised they had the whole thing on tape. At the time, Parker said he did not know where the recorder there was a recorder in the room. I had no idea, Parker said. Apparently, Charlie didn't either. They all that was all hid. 
The interview took place on October 11, 1973, after Parker and Hickson claimed they were abducted by aliens while fishing from the banks of the Pascagoula River. News of the event thrust the two into the media spotlight and put the town of Pascagoula on the map. It was unwanted attention for Parker, who tries to distance himself from it. However, events in Parker's life led him to feel he needed to tell his story, and he published a book in 2018 detailing his experience. Once again, the event became the center of attention for many, and Clarion Ledger published the stories about the book and the other people claimed to have witnessed unidentified objects in the night sky. Now, the 47-year-old story continues with the release of the interview recording. It was a big light that came out of the clouds, Parker said. It was a blinding light. It was hard to tell with the light so bright, but it looked like it was shaped like a football, I would say. Just uh, estimating, it was about 80 feet. It made very little sound. It was just a hissing noise. Parker said three legless creatures floated from the craft. One had no neck with gray wrinkled skin. Another had a neck and appeared more feminine. Parker described their hands as being shaped like mittens or crab claws. When one of the creatures put one of the claws around his arm, Parker said he was terrified. But then another feeling overcame his body. I think they injected us with something to calm us down, Parker said. I was kind of numb and went along with the program. Parker said the creatures held his, held his and Hickson's arms and floated them into the craft where examinations were performed on the two. They then returned to the bank of the river, and after some debate, the two decided they needed to alert authorities and ended up in an interview room at the sheriff's office. During the interview, Parker remained silent, something he regretted when he listened to the recording. I wish I had really opened up about them and about it and told them everything, Parker said. Hickson, who has since died, tried to explain during a 1973 interview what happened and what he saw, including going into the craft. And they glided me into that thing, Hickson said. You know, just how you just guide somebody. All of us moved like we were floating through air. And when I got where they had me, you know just kind of had me there. There were no seats, no chain. They just moved me around. I couldn't resist them. Just floated. Felt no sensation, no pain. They kept me in that position a little while, and then they'd raise me back up. Hickson also tried to describe a machine he thought was used for medical examination. No, it wasn't like an x-ray machine, Hickson said. There ain't no way to describe it. It looked like an eye, like a big eye. It was some kind of attachment to it. It moved. It looked like a big eye and it went all over my body, up and down, and then they left me. Hickson answered many questions and described to the aliens, and described that the aliens as being about five feet tall with a single leg and foot shaped like appendage without toes. He said they had appeared to be, uh, they appeared to have ears, a nose, and a mouth, but none of the features looked human. He said he was scared, so he couldn't remember if they had eyes. He also said he couldn't remember details about leaving the craft, only Parker's reaction. The only thing I remember is that the kid Calvin just standing there, Hickson said. I've never seen that sort of fear in a man's face as I saw on Calvin's. It took me a while to get him back to his senses, and the first thing I told him was, Son, ain't nobody gonna believe this. Let's just keep the whole things to ourselves. Well, the more I thought about it, the more I thought we had to let some officials know. After the questioning, Diamond and Ryder left the room. Ryder, now retired and living in Van Cleve, said he didn't believe any of Hickson's story. I wasn't really impressed with them, Ryder said. You have people trying to get out of notor get notoriety, and I thought they were trying to get notoriety with the spaceship. While Parker and Hickson were alone, the hidden recorder was still recording. What was, recorder what was recorded changed Ryder's mind. The two talked about fear, sleeplessness, and the needing to see a doctor, among other things. At times, it was almost like they were talking to themselves. Jesus Christ, God have mercy, I thought. I've been through one hell on this earth, and now I've got to go through something like this, Hickson said. But they could have, you know, I guess they, well, they could have harmed us, son. They had us. They could have done anything to us, but they didn't hurt me. Parker spoke mainly about his anxiety. I just want to cry right now, Parker said. What's so damn about it is no one's going to believe us. I got to go, I got to get home and get to bed and take some nervous pills or something. See a doctor or something. I can't stand this. I'm about to go all to pieces. I can't sleep like this. I'm damn near crazy. The two continued talking, and Ryder still remembers Parker's words. 
I put them in a room with a voice activator recorder, and that convinced me, Ryder said. But that boy was talking about them coming back to get us. You had an 18-year-old who had never seen anything. He was genuinely scared. He was telling Charlie, don't talk to the deputies. They'll come back and get us. They didn't make it up. I can guarantee that. And I will link to this in the show notes. If you scroll down to the bottom of the article, there is a SoundCloud file of the interview of the recording that was found. So that is that is kind of cool to sit down and listen to. But an update on uh, Pascagoula, which is another past episode. Update number three. This is from Coast to Coast, written by my favorite Tim Banal. Ghost photographed at Haunted Hotel. Can you guess which Haunted Hotel? An eerie picture taken in a notoriously haunted hotel in Colorado features what some suspect some some suspect is the head of a spirit caught on film. The spooky photograph was taken on Sunday evening during a ghost tour at the Stanley Hotel, which famously served as an inspiration for Stanley Kubrick's uh, film The Shining. Also Stephen King's book. I don't know why Tim didn't put that in there. The group's guide, Marina Prickle, shared the image on Facebook and provided a bit of background as to what people are seeing. This was taken tonight by one of my guests on the Spirit Tour, she wrote. This is the portal mirror in the basement of the concert hall people often see glimpses of other dimensions in. You can clearly see a face peeking around the side there. Indeed, as Prickle observed, there does appear to be someone's head looking out from the reflection of the mirror. The original version of the image, which the tour guy later provided, may be even spookier than the enhanced version at the, of at the potential ghost looks out of place in the scene. Of course, one cannot rule out the possibility that the apparition in the photo was someone else on the tour who happened to be in the right place at the right time, especially since guests are encouraged to take pictures of the mirror in the hopes of capturing something anomalous with their cameras. I don't think I got to see a mirror when I went on the ghost tour. Is there a mirror? I don't remember. I, I surely would have taken pictures. I would have to go back and look. With that in mind, what's your take on this peculiar photo? Is it a ghost peering back at the group or a glimpse into another dimension? Or merely a fellow visitor to the hotel that evening? And it is a weird picture because it... And it might just be the flash or the lighting or something, but you see... It's almost like someone peeking around, and if they are peeking around, they are bent over, like ver like it is a vertical picture, unless I'm thinking of it a different way, but it almost looks like someone is bent all the way down, uh, peeking in the mirror. They appear to be bald, and they're gray. They, it has a sort of Uncle Fester slash uh, Anakin Skywalker without his Darth Vader helmet on kind of vibe to it. So I don't know. It might just be the flash making him look gray and white, but it is a spooky picture. So three updates on three stories that we have covered on the show. And that has been this episode's local headlines. Okay, so tonight on Your Small Town Secret, I've got just one story but it's kind of involved, and now kind of looking back on it, I think it might have to be something where I do a deep dive into it, maybe do on a future episode at some point. But this came from Sebastian Nelson, which he has sent us a couple of things. Us, Once again, I'm doing it. Me, a couple of things before on the show. Everyone, He lives around Eureka, California, I believe, and every once in a while stumbles across uh, some, strange, some strange newspaper articles. And so in order... Uh, to kind of piece this together a little bit, I'm going to go through his Instagram. He found, first he was given this little snippet, Man Vanishes Car in River, Eureka. Humboldt County Sheriff's Deputy said last night a missing state employee had checked into a Redway Motel near Garberville shortly before his car was found in the flood-swollen Eel River. The missing man is Thomas P. Meehan of Concord, a referee in the State Department of Employment Appeals Bureau. Deputy said Meehan, in his 30s, has a wife, Florence, and, a small, ch and small children. He had been in Eureka, 70 miles north of Garberville, Friday on business. 
Officers said that the Redway Motel owner, Chip Noonmaker, told them Meehan checked into the motel shortly before 9 p.m. Friday sometime. In the next one and a half hours, he left his suitcase still in the motel room. Officers said Noonmaker told them Meehan was, ta was talking strangely, saying, I have the funniest feeling that I'm dead. Noonmaker said Meehan did not appear drunk. So that's the first kind of article that he gives me. And then he gets another article. And this is what he actually read or read, wrote an Instagram about it. He says, okay, so this is getting stranger. I need some Jessica Fletcher here. According to the interweb, Meehan's body was found 19 days later. It had washed ashore downstream from the car accident. It had a head wound. The dead man's lungs were full of water. This fact showed that me showed me that he had drowned. Showed that he had drowned. The police said Meehan had been thrown from the car as it crashed into the river. He had banged his head as he was thrown out. He had landed in the water unconscious, and that's why he is drowned. So I, I, I guess I was kind of looking at this weird for a little bit. I assumed that he kind of showed up at the hotel after he supposedly drowned. But I think it's he showed up at the hotel and then left an hour and a half into it and then was found drowned. But here is kind of a broader article uh, from his hotel experiences. This one I, it looks like it's from the San Francisco Examiner. Uh, from 1963 is when this story happened. Uh, bear with me. I'm kind of piecing this all together from various articles here. That's why I'm only doing one because it's a little bit involved, like I said. Uh, Do I Look Dead is the, is the name of the article. The mystery man who thought he had died and then vanished. Do I look like I'm dead? I get the funniest feeling that I'm dead and that I've caused the whole world to die with me. These words were spoken Friday night by Thomas P. Meehan, 39-year-old Concord attorney and referee for the State Department of Employee Appeals Bureau here to a motel operator near Garberville. An hour and a half later, Meehan vanished in a baffling mystery, as any fiction writer might have concocted. Car in River. Among the pieces of the puzzle were the strange con conversation with the motel owner, a car nearly submerged in the flood swollen Eel River, and a set of bloody footprints. Sheriff's investigators and California Highway Patrol of officers pieced together the sequence of events leading up to Meehan's disappearance. He left Eureka for Concord about 2 p.m. Friday. After hearing a week's worth of appeals and after complaining of the flu. In hotel. Sometime between 4.30 and 5.30 p.m., he checked into the 40 Winks Motel at Redway two miles north of Garberville. About 6.45 p.m., he appeared at Garberville General Hospital, asked for treatment, and then suddenly bolted. At 7 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Martin of Myers Flat reported to the highway patrol that they had seen the, tall, the taillights of a car on Highway 101 vanish, apparently into the swirling Eel River. At 8 p.m., Meehan was back at the motel asking the owner, Chip Noonmaker, if he looked dead. At 9.30 p.m., another motel employee went to Meehan's room and told him a call placed to his wife in Concord could not be completed because the storm had disrupted phone service. Auto found. About 10.45 p.m., Meehan's car submerged except for his tail the still shining taillights was found in the Eel River. There was blood on the top of the car, and the trail of bloody footprints led up to the bank for 30 feet and then abruptly vanished. Investigators said it would seem that Meehan, if he was in the car, survived for the 30-foot plunge from the highway. Then the right front window of the car was open, and there was bloody footprints. Two-day search. But a two-day search of the nearby motels and hotels Failed to, turn up in, failed to turn up the attorney, and neither his family nor his co-workers here had heard from him. Shut. Had heard from him. Newmaker said that Meehan's shoes and trouser cuffs were muddy when he talked to him at 8 p.m., but at 9.30, when the motel worker Harry Young informed Meehan that his phone call could not be completed, his shoes had been cleaned, and he had changed into a black suit and white shirt. He was kind of agitated when he talked to Newmaker and talked about feeling dead, said Young, 
but he seemed okay when I saw him, except that he looked a little tired. Suitcase. He asked about his uh, wet. He asked about the weather and the condition of the roads, and everything seemed all right. We never saw him again. Meehan's suitcase and other belongings were left behind in the motel. Senior District Referee James Healy set here said Meehan was an excellent employee, well above average, steady, consistent, and reliable. The attorney, his wife, and their four children live at 3789 Juniper Drive, Concord. Meehan recently was elected to a second four-year term as the director of the Concord Community Hospital. So, a strange tale altogether. A uh, guy who thinks he's dead, he comes, you know, he vanishes, he comes in, he goes away. Like, just it's just all over the place, and it's very strange. Then, then there is this little article. Uh, it doesn't really have a headline, I don't see it here. A million dollar civil damage suit has been filed in San Francisco in one of the most baffling cases in Humboldt County. Law enforcement history. The disappearance and death last February of Thomas P. Meehan, a 38-year-old State Department of Employee referee, uh, the suit was filed in behalf of Meehan's widow, Florence, and their four children. Charges that another state employee who was with Meehan in Eureka gave him a mind-warping drug known as LDS. They're saying L it says LDS in the newspaper, but I think they're saying LSD. The drug, illegal for general use in California, causes hallucinations, and those, according to several witnesses at the time, Meehan seemed to have had before he vanished that night of February 1st. Named as defendants in the suit are Paul Herbert, official reporter for the State Department of Employment, and the man who allegedly gave Meehan the drug. Garberville General Hospital, where Meehan applied for help and ran out minutes later before a doctor could see him. Uh, the physician who was on duty at the time, and I'm not quite sure if there's like a typo or I just, I can't see it right, but it it looks like it says, and 10, John does. I don't know what that means. Accused of peddling LSD freely and easily in San Francisco. It's almost like there's a line missing from the bottom of that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting case. Like, did this dude give him LSD because he wanted LSD? Did he slip him the LSD? Is this like an MK Ultra thing? Yeah, no, all sorts of stuff. So we might look at this more in depth and see what has come of it since. So thanks, Sebastian. Your little little news stories are always welcome on the show. They're always interesting. They're always fun to chop into. But there we go. That has been this this episode's Your Small Town's a Secret segment. And if you have a small town secret to share, a uh, mysterious, true crimey, vanishy LSD, am I dead? Am I not dead? Uh, am I in the river? Am I not? You know, just oof. Or, uh, that'll work. Uh, you can send me a crypto report. You can send me UFO stuff, your own personal experiences, uh, your own the legends from your town. Uh, any way you want to give it to me, I write me right into it. We can set up an interview. You can send me an article. You could even record it yourself if you want to, and I'll put it on here. Uh, the best way to do it is to go to stscast.com, scroll down the bottom of the main page, and there's an email form to fill out, and that'll get to me. Uh, you can also get at me on social media. I'm most active on Twitter. That is at stscast. Facebook is also at stscast. And Instagram is uh, at stscast.gram. So uh, there's also a Reddit, a subreddit, which is linked on stscast as well. Uh, other things that you can find on STS Cast are ways to support the show. Uh, the Patreon link is there. We give away stickers, uh, buttons. You have you can get access to all the music I make. You can get access to an ad-free, promo-free version of the show. Uh, an extra show that comes out on the off weeks of this show. So that means you get content every week if you're on the Patreon. A one, three, and five dollar tier. Uh, so that can be found on the main site, uh, or you can go to patreon.com slash stscast and find it there as well. Uh, you can also go to uh, the merch store and buy shirts and coffee mugs and phone cases and uh, other stickers that you can't get through Patreon. Uh, and just all sorts of goodies. 
Uh, if you cannot support the show financially but still want to help out, just leave a review and a rating. Both would be great on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice that helps the show just ever, ever claw more towards the top. And uh, just easiest thing to do is just tell a friend and get someone, you know, else to listen to it. I say it all the time. If everyone that listens to the show gets one more person to listen to the show, then the audience automatically doubles just like that. So thanks for the support, everyone. Um, hopefully we'll have some new Patreons to shout out in the in the upcoming episodes. But even if you're not on Patreon and you're just listening to the show and enjoying it, uh, I can't thank I can't thank you enough. I can't tell you how much it means to me that people seem to actually enjoy this show, and I will keep doing it as long as everything works out like it has been. So that is this this uh, that's episode four for season four, everyone, and I'll be back. Next week is middle of the season. It's episode five. So you know what that means. True crime night. Uh, we'll be back with some a couple of true crime stories. Some uh, wrongfully accused stories to talk about next episode. So got that to look forward to. Until then, remember, every town has a secret. What is yours? <laughs>